Uh, yes, so please, uh, Dr. Hassan Karim from GE will give the first lecture on uh, combustion of hydrogen. Please go ahead. Hey, assalamu alaikum. Uh, it's nice to say assalamu alaikum. I have never, I've not said it in any big presentation in USA. And good morning to all of you. Okay. Uh, it's a, my honor to come and talk to you. Uh, I work in the industry. Uh, so my talk today, I didn't know like at what level should I target the talk, what kind of audience. So before I start the talk, I want to ask you a question. How many of you know what gas turbine is? There are a few who doesn't know gas turbine. Okay, good. Uh, how many of you have seen a gas turbine? Okay, that's good. Thank you. That, that's, before I started, I just wanted to make sure I know what level I'm talking to. Okay. Uh, if I go for, uh, I want this uh, discussion to be interactive. Uh, please feel free to stop me uh, as you have questions. Sometimes I tend to go fast. Uh, yeah, it's for you to stop me and ask me questions so that you get the most out of it, okay? And sometimes uh, I will not answer all the questions because I work for an industry and I can't tell you everything that I know, okay? Okay. So... Uh, in context, uh, so I just wanted to, before I introduce the problem, I just wanted to tell you, for some of you who didn't see a gas turbine, what gas turbine is and go from there on, okay? So uh, this is a power plant, okay? In a power, we, when I used to work in a gas turbine, I used to think gas turbines are big. They are pretty big, okay? But if you go to the power plant, you guys see it, pointer? Oh, which one? This one? Yeah, this one. Yeah. Okay, I got it. So this is the uh, uh, this is a gas turbine. Okay, it looks small in a power plant. Uh, so the rest are basically the air separation, air cleaner, HRSG, and the intake valve. So and then you see like there is a fuel and air that comes in and uh, it, com it finishes combustion, and then you move a turbine and you get a power, okay? So very, uh, compared to a power, uh, power plant, a gas turbine is small, but compared to you and me, a gas turbine fills, uh, a big size gas turbine would be half of this room. Uh, so <laughs> I called it a roaring fire. Do you know why I called this? Just a guess, why did I call it? Uh, I compared it to a dragon, and I called it a roaring fire. Uh, there's a reason why I call that this. Any guess? Go ahead. A noise, what kind of noise? Terrible noise, yeah. Yes, yes, it does produce noise, but it's not the audible noise that, that you hear. Uh, there's something called combustion dynamics, okay? In a gas turbine, we, you worry about uh, emissions because that's what you see, that's what your life gets affected by, but a power producer and the manufacturer, we worry about the acoustics. Combustion creates a lot of waves, and those waves could come in many different frequencies, and they break the engines. So they could break an engine in seconds, okay? So it's like a dinosaur, because it's a, like it, has, uh, it has basically fire, and it, it actually makes noise, okay? And, and like most, when we may develop a gas turbine, it is basically how to keep your, we call it quiet, that's where you spend most of your time. Like we have spent hundreds of tests and each test might cost like 100,000 a day. So just to give you, give you an example, a good combustion system, when we are trying to develop that for single fuel, could go up to like, including turbine, would go like close to $100 million. So it's like a several years project. It takes uh, hundreds of people who works in a turbine, compressor, combustion, to, bring, to make this happen, okay? So again, as I mentioned, this looks huge. Uh, but it's, it's, it's small. And there is an opportunity. Many of you I know here uh, work in the field of computational, uh, computational modeling. Uh, 
testing with hydrogen will become very expensive. Hydrogen, as you know, is an expensive fuel. So if currently we pay X, uh, we will pay 1.8 or like around 2.5, 1.8 to 2.5 X the cost of, of a test. Like I'll give you an example. In my lab, uh, we run tests, uh, around 100 tests a year for development of different combustion system. And the most expensive one, the H class, a 16 hour shift could cost more than $100,000. So it's just with natural gas, okay? So just think about now uh, how much the cost increases if you are trying to b burn hydrogen. And the, pro the problem with the hydrogen is that hydrogen comes not, you have methane, now you have hydrogen, but there is a big spectrum here where the power producers wants to use any fuel they have. Today they want 10% blend of hydrogen, tomorrow they might want 50%, and then one day they get full hydrogen, they want to use it. So the problem just multiplies on you because uh, with hydrogen composition, uh, the dynamics that I told you, the noise, it's not monotonic. So you can't do an experiment at zero and 100 and draw a line or zero and 50 and draw a line in between to say, hey, I'm done. Okay, I know what to behave. It does not. Uh, it's very non-monotonic. That's why we have to keep doing testing. We, we model it, we run, we test and model, we test and model. That's like our, our uh, a combustion engineer's day-to-day uh, -day life. You test, you predict, you go and test. The best way when I started it, we used to always test. Today, we, most of our time goes modeling. So we model, we predict, we go, we test, validate, we check our models are wrong or good, come back, change the model, redesign it, go back to the lab. So that's why there is big opportunity. And you know there are many levels of fatalities. And today, like a billion cell model can run in a week on a, like a GPU clusters. We have, we have capability and this is becoming more norm that people would run higher order models. So what you can think of, like instead of running in the lab, we want to run in the computers and get the results. And then when we got all the results looks good, we go and run in the lab, okay? That's, that's why there's a big opportunity there. Okay, so we have been designing at it for many years, okay? Uh, from uh, when I joined, like 1990, I finished my PhD in 1998. Then at that time, the biggest uh, interest in gas turbine was CO and NOx, okay? So I started in a company called Precision Combustion, initially which made catalytic combustor. Catalytic combustor seemed to be good for CO, and at that time CO was a big problem. Uh, so that was the craze of the dead, how to reduce CO. And CO and NOx, those were the goals. So if you look at a 7-HAO2 gas turbine, there are 12 combustion sections. So like 12 combustors are distributed around the annular space. So uh, when fuel and air combust in 12 spaces, they come and mix together and they go through the turbine. So just uh, in one minute, okay, you are one of them, takes approximately three tons of air. And that three tons of air is like 21 trailers, okay? And the, just think about the scales now. And then it basically is an equivalent of 6,500 backyard grills that are going, just one combustor, you have 12 of them. And it's producing around like, by using 12 can, it's producing around 340 megawatts. I guess maybe it's, that's equivalent to like 340,000 house or something that you can power, okay? And then the good thing about, we have become so good that we, can, we only produce a seven ounce of NOx. Just think about that. Like there are tons and tons of airflow going on. You are producing only seven ounce of NOx. But we, we were not bothered about CO2. So we, we produce 0.3 tons of CO2. And if you, a question for some of you uh, students like, so if I burn methane, okay, I'm burning 10 grams of fuel, okay? Should, would I produce more carbon dioxide or less carbon dioxide?
you will produce more, okay? If you look at the stoichiometric reaction, so if I, if I like burn, let's say, two pounds of ma methane, okay, I will be burning, like I'll be producing around five pounds. Because if you look at it uh, in the equation, like the stoichiometric equation, the basic chemistry, you will see there is a mole expansion. So from methane to basically carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is heavy. Methane is only carbon and hydrogen, which is like 12 plus uh, another four, 16. But carbon dioxide is 44, which is oxygen's molecular weight. Two oxygen is 32, and there is another carbon. So there's there is 30, 44, so from 16, whatever, pounds of methane that you would burn, you would produce 44 pounds of methane. So you're always producing more carbon dioxide. So that's why you fill up the world so easily with so much carbon dioxide, okay? So that's the background. And then, like a gas turbine, as I said, you are burning, uh, you, are, you have, you know, compressor, it compresses the air, then it goes through the combustor. So the, in a combustor, that flow, air flow, is going around like a, a f, uh, around like it's, we call it a volcanic hurricane because it it has temperature and it has speed. Okay, uh, do you can you guess category five? I I believe is like a hundred miles an hour or more. So the air is going that fast. Okay, through the combustor, but. Uh, the flame cannot go off, okay? Just, just think about it, like, uh, I know people don't smoke now, like if you light a match and hold it, a wind comes, it blows off, okay? But the technology is so good that you can have to keep that flame lit, uh, sorry, you have to keep that flame lit at category five of hurricane going on. So that's the speed it's going, okay? So now think about the enclosure where this, this hurricane or volcano is going on, you also have, like, you have to keep your metal, your surroundings cool, okay? So the temperature that we use for cooling the parts of the gas turbine, the air temperature is hotter than air in Venus, Venus like, so it's like around 800 to 900 F on modern gas turbine. So with using that air, you have to keep the gas turbine, co the metal or the turbines or the portion of the combustor robust. And how long? Like the power producers do not want to shut down. So when we get it, they say you have to continuously run for 8,000 hours, which is like a year. So if, you, if by that time, any of this time, your gas turbine fails, we call it a debt level. We provide LD, so we provide guarantee. Like that's the competition between different power uh, OEMs. We go to the power producers and I say, we are the best. Our engine will last this long, okay? And uh, can you guys guess like the efficiency or the megawatt, what does those determine? How do you like make more efficient engine? or how do you make more megawatt? Those are the two things the power producer need, wants. They want efficient engine, they want uh, more megawatt, okay? They do not normally care for what is getting produced, okay? The, we care, so the regulation cares. So that's why they have to care, because they pay penalty, okay? So, they, uh, so the two things that mostly controls uh, the efficiency is the inlet temperature that you come in, okay? And pressure. Megawatt also is controlled by the same thing. If you look at a cycle, you will see pressure and temperature basically controls uh, your efficiency. So why do we, they care for efficiency? If you have more efficient engine, you burn less fuel. So you, if you burn up, like these gas turbines are today, 40, 45%, but we use it called a combined cycle. So we have a steam turbine using the exhaust. That's where it goes to 60%, 65%. So that's where you basically are getting 60% of the fuel you burn that you are producing energy and you're selling to the customer and you're making money. So that's why they care about it, okay? Any questions? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I forgot the professor's name. 
Okay. Yeah, he mentioned about this, okay? So that this was my study. Why do we have to care about hydrogen, okay? Since we finished gas turbine 101. Uh, we have, people have been following the temperature uh, of the environment, and they basically see the temperature has, has gone up from 1880 till now. And as you look, like as the temperature goes up, so is the CO2 concentration, okay? There is a threshold. Uh, we don't want to exceed two two degrees of increase. And people, if you go to USA, some, there are, there's a half of the population, uh, they will say it's a correlation, it's not a causality, causality, okay? So they will say it's just related. But uh, even that we used to say the gas turbine manufacturer used to be close their eyes, but now they're all say no, it is what is the most important thing. CO2 is what is making the temperature go up. So the question is now, what do we do uh, to not create the hydrogen, or not create the CO2? Remember, any fuel that gas turbine burns, like all the, all the distillate, the kingdom produces all the petroleum fuel, they have a C with the fuel, so the CH bond repeats, so you have carbon. So how do you get rid of the carbon, or what, what else do you burn, okay? Okay, as somebody was mentioning that the most of the CO, uh, you know, power producing or gas turbine is the evil. Uh, what I'm trying to say here is we are 41% only, okay? <laughs> the rest comes from their different parts of the industry. If you look at transportation, which is also being, make, we are trying to make it green. So uh, uh, we are most, I don't know how many of you have electric vehicle, but in the USA, like every, I go to my, like when I first started, there were no zero. Now like half of the lot is full with like electric vehicle. They have chargers in every parking lot, private, in any par public parking lot that you go to, you would find chargers, okay? Because the other part, transportation is what you are trying to make it free. But as you make transportation free, uh, basically you need more and more power to be produced. In, and then on top of it, there is a billion people in the world that don't have power. Today, uh, we produce like 27 kiloterawatt hours, and we reduce like every year that 13.5 gigatons of uh, CO2. In my company's website, uh, if you want, I can send you the link. There, is a, there are some podcasts, okay? Uh, and that podcast would give you a good sense of uh, like what that gigaton means. It's like, I, I forgot, like that gigaton means maybe like couple of Mount Everest, okay, <laughs> that can go in. So it's huge. And you, we think Earth is big, uh, the atmosphere is big, it's big. But the rate we consume power and our need for power is going up, it, nothing is inexhaustible. So you will fill it up. So the question is, what can we do better? How can we not... Uh, produce CO2, okay? So there is a lot of opportunities that we can, uh, we can reduce our CO2. So, okay, again, so hydro, let me check something. I think I missed, okay. No, it closed. Okay, I think I can go. Okay, so, uh, there are two ways to get rid of the carbon. Pretty easy, take your methane and split it, okay? Uh, you can split it before combustion. Uh, uh, what do you need to split it? How will you split it? You just need energy, okay? You can do it chemically or you can put a, a, a you can basically, that's pre-combustion, you break it, okay? And you have hydrogen, that's like reforming, okay? So in a reforming process, you take methane uh, and steam, and you get back CO and hydrogen. And what you can do is you can use a water gas shift reaction and then produce more hydrogen. Basically, you shift more CO towards water. But you are still left with carbon, and you have to get rid of that carbon, okay? So, or basically, the other way to start, as somebody was talking about it, you do electrolysis. So you have water. You basically separate the oxygen and get two molecules from one molecule of water, you get uh, one a molecule of hydrogen, 
and one atom of oxygen. That's one way of doing it, okay? The other is post-combustion, and we GE are doing both. Post-combustion means uh, you take your exhaust and you try to find your CO2, okay? So if uh, in a gas turbine uh, exhaust, the CO2 is in the eight to 9%, depending on the class of gas turbine do you use, like an E class, which is like a low efficiency gas turbine, it would be less, it would be four or 5%, but as you go up to like an H class, there would be 10 to 12%. So you basically, but that, the problem with that is like when you have nine to 10%, the, it's not very efficient, to separate them. So what people use is called, you guys might may heard it, exhaust gas recirculation. So they take the exhaust and fit it back again. So that's how they enrich the amount of exhaust carbon dioxide. As a result, the technology or the cost to scrub those CO2 goes down. So we work on both sides, okay? So we don't know which is going to win in the marketplace. So we are not saying we are going to do this and not do that. As we are trying to build our combustion system, enable for hydrogen, we are also trying to do EGR. So we are trying to work. We have both. The other important thing about hydrogen is, can you guess like how long does a power producer run, a, run an engine? Like you run your cars four years, five years? Seven, I keep my cars 10 years, I try to. Yeah, 25, 30 years, okay? So sitting here, the, those people are thinking, what I am buying today, okay? It must have the capability of 100% hydrogen. Even though there is no fuel today, okay, that, that can give you that much hydrogen, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll show you. But because to future-proof them, future-proof their investment, they say, you have to give me some hydrogen capability, otherwise I'm not buying your gas turbine. So we, the gas turbine manufacturer, are in big trouble because uh, our, we were not thinking five years back that we need to sell a gas turbine that's like at least 15, 20, 50% hydrogen capable. Okay, so that's a big problem for us, and that's where a lot of investment is being made in all the gas turbine manufacturing companies to make basically a combustion system that works with hydrogen, because otherwise you can't sell your existing product, okay? So that's why there is so, even though we don't have enough hydrogen to burn, but your customer wants them because uh, they want to future-proof their investment. Okay, go ahead. Knox. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm coming. The focus is CO2 but uh, they don't want to lose the, like the, the limit for NOx, okay? So, so your job has got harder, because what they say today, like if you go to US, you can sell a gas turbine at different uh, uh, NOx PPM. There is 25 PPM is one, nine is one, three is another, but then they use a, a basically a catalyst to bring it down to two PPM. So if you are going to go sell now a gas turbine, they would come to you and say, I don't want to buy a gas turbine more than 25 ppm NOx. And so the answer to your question is no, we are not trying to give up the, the good progress that we made with the other, other uh, emissions technology, okay? Uh, especially NOx, okay? Yeah. Yeah. The what? The first one? So, Cost? With the EGR and the hydrogen? Yeah. 
It, so, okay, it all depends. Uh, when you, a customer, if he has land around and he has the capital, an EGR becomes very easy, okay? Because EGR needs a lot of land around it, okay, to bring, but uh, so for, for us, EGR becomes easy then, okay? But today, if you come back and say, hey, give me a, a combustion technology that burns 100% hydrogen, I can give you, I will talk to you. But that's something that produces more knocks. What we, as I was telling somebody, we don't want to give up the good knocks. So there is nothing there right now that will do very good knocks and 100% hydrogen. So for, it makes sense to go towards EGR now, okay? if you have that capability. Okay, how many of you read Jules Verne when you grew up, when you were growing up? Did you guys read Jules Verne? You are aware of him? Okay, he wrote many f great books, okay? When I was growing up, I read like Around the World in 80 Days, and then Professor Nemo, I believe, I forgot the name. He was my, one of my favorite characters. He, he, it was about a submarine, okay? So at that time, nobody knew what submarine was. He wrote stories about submarine. So look at what he said, okay? He basically said, one day he feels like he thinks that we will use hydrogen and oxygen water as a fuel, okay? So we are right there, we are there, no, okay? And he, I bolded out some letter, I chose hydrogen and I left out oxygen. We don't know what to do with oxygen, okay? We don't want to burn hydrogen and oxygen together. It creates more problem, okay? So it's, it will be singly, and it's going to produce basically an, an endless supply of heat and light, okay, which is true, okay? Uh, and it said, like, the amount of energy that you will get is more than what coal is giving you. But I am glad that he was wrong in one thing. Do you know what was he wrong about? He was wrong about was he thought we will finish coal, and then we will do this. But maybe he did not know how much coal the world had, or maybe we woke up early, okay? So that's why I, I, I'm glad that he was wrong, that uh, we didn't finish. There is a lot of coal in the world, okay? And there are countries who produces those. Germany produces a lot of coal. They stopped producing coal, but now they like, they, during the recent time, they might have again gone back to coal. Coal is one of the worst of CO2 and every other emission that you can think of. Coal was, people went off coal because there was NOx, there was other issues that were produced much more than any other fuel. Coal is the most unclean fuel that you can burn, okay? So Mr. Jules Verne's thought about this problem many years back. There was one more, I, could, I think I didn't talk about this. Okay, this is the back. I am messing up both going forward and backward. Okay, what I wanted to, yeah. I wanted to also talk about this, okay? So remember I said hydrogen. Our, again, I come back to our 7HO2 engine because that's like one of our most advanced engine. We have another engine after that called 7HO3, which are for 60 hertz market. I believe over here it's a 60 hertz market, 60 hertz and 50 hertz. So if today, you want to say, okay, I don't want to use any natural gas. I want to go to all hydrogen. Just look at the amount of hydrogen we need, okay? So 530 metric ton per day, which is 2% of what the amount basically of hydrogen made in a day, okay? So if I put 50 of those gas turbines, uh, you are basically exhausted all the capa all the hydrogen that's there today. That's manufactured. You have to manufacture hydrogen, okay? So that's the problem. So what we believe then is the smaller engines uh, will be first to adopt uh, hydrogen more and more because the amount of hydrogen that you need is small and it can be locally produced. And, uh, and the producer can burn it, okay? So the bigger engines are a problem because they need so much hydrogen. Okay, so then, are you guys familiar with different names of hydrogen? Okay, some of you are. Okay, so the cleanest of hydrogen that you could get is, again, everything starts with water. 
So the water, you need energy to separate uh, hydrogen and oxygen. So if you generate that from renewables, meaning like either use wind uh, or some other renewable source of power or solar, uh, then that's green because that is like you have not, nothing to do with C. There is no carbon anywhere in the pool of creating that fuel. You have not used anything that needs the carbon. So you're not putting any carbon in the atmosphere, okay? There was the other opposite that was gray, okay? Gray is when you have methane or any other fuel uh, distillate, you take and you do steam reforming. It's a very, steam reforming is very common. They do it everywhere. That's how they produce hydrogen in the refinery today, okay? So that's, uh, that's great. So then what do you do with the carbon? You put it up on the environment, basically. But if you take that, uh, and, and there are other in between, okay? So there's blue, basically. It's gray or brown, but you take the CO2 and you put it in the ground or you put it somewhere, okay? Basically, don't put the CO2 up in the environment. And Earth has a great capacity of getting, of basically holding CO2, okay? There's a lot of CO2, not only just as methane, as C in Earth, but there also as CO2, okay? And basically, the, there are the pink purple. Uh, if you use nuclear power, and produce hydrogen that's pink. I think that's a, so there are all these different color. You will see, you will see they mention. It's all how you produce your hydrogen. The best way to produce your hydrogen is to through electrolysis or through renewable, where the power is basically through renewable so that you don't put any CO, you don't make any CO2, you don't break any CO2 or anything. Also, okay, sorry. Okay, that's good. So there is a problem with, okay. So the question is now, uh, how much, like how much carbon do I have to remove uh, f from the fuel, from methane, to make it a meaningful contribution, okay? So you look at this graph basically, does it work? So what it does is like when you are like burning at, like from this side, like methane, okay, from, go from this side. This is zero up to like 60% only. You just reduced 40 or 30% of your fuel, okay, carbon. So you really have to go a lot more into hydrogen. You have to go like around 80 to 90% around here to say I have reduced 90% of my carbon. So that's a big issue because you, you, if you do today like 50%, you will be reducing only 20% of your carbon, okay? Because uh, it's, it's just the way the molecule is, I'll, I'll talk about it, it's the energy content in there, okay? So you, the problem then is like, you really have to do a good job or you have to really remove a lot of carbon and put a lot more hydrogen in, a, in, in the blend to get to a good amount of CO, C reduction or C reduction, okay? So that's the problem. Okay, now let's talk about hydrogen. What, what, and, and what you will see is this. Uh, some of the things, the problem with combustion with hydrogen, it's all inherent in, in what I'm going to talk here. And you will, you will see how that happens, okay? So yeah, it's the first element in the periodic table. It's, it's the most, uh, it's the most uh, basically, common element in the universe, but you don't get it. You basically, you ha it's tied up with something, it's not free. It always likes to be in, in, in engaged, so you have to break it apart and get it, okay? Uh, it's colorless, it's odorless, okay? So it, it becomes liquid around like minus 423 F, I believe. But the thing, look at this, like when it's a gas, a gram of hydrogen can occupy 11 liters, okay? If you look at hydrogen, uh, it has l by mass. It is one of the one of the most uh, most energy-containing fuel. Okay, but if you look at by volume, it is not. 
and and it is by volume that's what we need. Uh, I will come. We will hand. We'll do this discussion later because what you will find is compared to methane by volume, it's three times, three and a half times less. But it reacts very fast. Its chemistry is very fast, but it does not have enough by volume energy. So you need to really put in a lot of uh, a lot burn a lot of volumetric amount of amount of uh, hydrogen to make the same energy, okay? It's flammability range. It's actually on the lean side. I think it's even flammable below 4%, especially in pressure, okay? But on the rich side, it, it is much more flammable, okay? It can sustain flame through up to like 75%, so that creates a problem. We will talk about it, okay? Auto ignition temperature is high, uh, but uh, the ignition energy that you need to do it is low. So that creates a problem. And then we'll talk about something called uh, burning velocity. You know, like when you burn something, it is the speed at which it can burn. There, there's a name, there is a flame that tries to go. In a gas turbine, it's sort of like a stationary flame. But uh, flame can move. Flame has its own speed, okay? That speed is called flame speed, and it basically tells you how reactive the flame is. So we'll talk about this. So all this thing you will see, like, as you go into using, uh, try to use hydrogen, will create an issue for gas turbine combustion system. So just remember this table, and later on when you come back at the end of the, uh, end of the thing, you will see, like, how each of them made uh, again, some quickly, uh, we know the, the molecular weight I talked about. Like molecular weight is 16 versus 2. So as a result, like it per mole, it really looks good, but per mass, it's not. So it's a very small size molecule. It, uh, what else? If look at the, uh, this is interesting. You look at the heating values, okay? If you look at volumetrically, that's like standard cubic feet, you will see it's like three and a half times less. Can you guess like what, what does that do to gas turbine or around gas turbine? Uh, what, what will that, pro how will that affect as a problem? Like just think about a power plant and it has pipes that bring in gas and, and then you have a gas turbine. So now all of a sudden the fuel that you are trying to use, that fuel has three and a half times volumetrically uh, less energy, what will happen? You will need bigger pipes, do you follow? Uh, so you'll need more power or bigger pipes, okay? So that's the problem because there is infrastructure already made uh, that you cannot just go and change it, okay? So the, what you have to accept then maybe you will run at higher velocities, okay? The pipes are all, if you go, everything has a standard, okay? So if you go, the pipe has a standard that you want to run at this velocity is not much. So those are some of the problems you will face, but we'll talk more, okay? So some of you may know, some of you may not know, depending on your thing. There are, there are two kinds of flame, okay? Uh, one is a premixed flame, and one is a diffusion flame. A premixed flame is, okay, no, uh, let's start with diffusion flame. Diffusion flame is basically, you have fuel, you have air, fuel and air needs to, you bring them together in a place and you need a match, they light and they go. So you don't have to do anything special. Only thing is to make sure they come together, okay? So that was the earliest combustion technology. The, the, your candle you lit in a house is a diffusion flame, okay? So a diffusion flame, it, it's very easy to do. It is stable, robust, uh, but it creates as somebody was saying, a lot of NOx because it produces very high flame temperature, okay? On the other hand, like exactly this 30 years or 40 years back when there was a push to reduce NOx emission, as you were mentioning, global warming uh, uh, agent. So what people did was change the technology of the gas turbine from diffusion flame to comb uh, premix combustion. So just like uh, we are in a transition, a cusp of transition during 80s to 2000. The whole gas turbine technology basically changed its course from diffusion flame 
to premix. And there were a lot of issues that also, like dynamics became a problem, the sound became a problem for gas turbines due to premix combustion, okay? So we'll talk through this. And the good thing about premix combustion is that you can um, basically create much lower NOx emission, okay? What kind of time do you have? 50 minutes? Okay, I think I need to go fast. <laughs> okay, so as I said, there is a non premix system and premix system. It's very simple. Like uh, the point here was uh, we are trying to make. Okay, oh, sorry, I have to learn this. Okay, so you have a very high temperature when you do a diffusion flame and it becomes, uh, it creates a lot of, a uh, lot of pollution, whereas you really do not have to create that high temperature. So let's say you need it for your gas turbine, you needed a temperature of 2000 F, uh, sorry, I talk in F, and we work in pounds. Uh, I know all of you must work in SI unit, sorry about that, I can't change. Okay, so if you need like a 1900 or 2000 F uh, in premix combustion, you will just create that and, and basically your turbine will take that 1900. But in a diffusion flame, you will create something like 3500, 4000 F, depending on the fuel, then you will bring back more air, but your emissions are getting produced. So that's the big difference, but it's more stable, creates more NOx, okay? Okay, okay. so I'm gonna go through this quickly. So as I said, uh, initially, uh, G is to make all diffusion flame non premix combustion system, and we have many of them. And just like we, they used everything, anything, any fuel you want to burn, they would burn it because it's robust. Uh, there was not much uh, change needed. You just change the tip of the injector. So GE has system with 100% hydrogen or close to 100% hydrogen in the field, but they were all non premixed okay? So we have over 100 gas turbines now working at different places in the world, uh, and, and it has more than 8 million hours of operation, but the problem is all of them produces very high NOx, and, 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 and to, to basically reduce NOx, you put a diluent to bring the flame temperature down, and that diluent basically is an efficiency loss. So power producers do not want to use that kind of an engine. But what they have bought, as I said, 30 years back, it's so good that they don't want to give it up. They're still making money. All these engines, like depending on time, 1990, even earlier engines we still have that are producing, uh, high, producing power. And if you compare like all the gas turbine manufacturer, GE has, has highest market share in the hydrogen producing engines, okay? Hydrogen using engines, sorry. No. So we, okay. And, and this talks about where our, most of our uh, engines are, so you could see, and the class. So there are class of engine, they started with B, E, uh, F, H, like it all, dip, it all basically means as you go up in the alphabets, you are going up in uh, your inlet temperature and inlet pressure, okay? So moving, so he, uh, th these are some power plants, let's just jump through this. Okay, so now we, as I said, we also want to sell and, and, and sell and develop our premix technology for uh, hydrogen. Our combustion system has some capability. It's not 100% hydrogen. Depending on the combustion system, they have capabilities, and these are some of the customers that we are collaborating with. Either have completed a demo, or will be, will be doing a demo. So the first two, these are all done. Like a seven HAO2, I believe we ran 15% 15 uh, uh, hydrogen in blended fuel. It's not much. So it already had some capability. I think in Egypt, we ran about 30, 40%, 20 to 30%, but there are more engines coming up. As I said, now nobody wants to buy an engine, especially even when we try to sell engines in, in the kingdom, they will come back and say, what is the hydrogen capability, among other things, okay? They also want to burn one of the worst fuel, could be, but uh, uh, 
they will also say they want to burn hydrogen, okay? Let's move. Okay, so now we'll go and talk about combustion. I'll get some water. 50. 50 minutes. Good. I think I... Okay, maybe. Okay. So I, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with. So what I'm showing here are different fuels, okay? You, methane is the bottom, propane, benzene, ethylene. So equivalence ratio, uh, it's like, I don't know how many of you know, but it's like the oxygen you need for stoichiometric combustion versus the oxygen you, you have. And at one, you have just amount of oxygen that you need to completely burn the fuel, okay? So as it's a function of equivalence ratio, I think it's one over in the other industry, some other industries. But if you look up, hydrogen has the highest flame temperature, okay? And, and the reason is this, like I want you to just concentrate on the table. It's just some numbers that I made up yes, yes on last night. So what you have to look at is the second column and the third column, okay? So the first, second column, the fuel is methane, and, and the other one is hydrogen. So I made up some numbers. Let's say a gas turbine wants to run 800 F. That's like an hour F class temperature at like 240 PSI pressure, okay? And a flame temperature of 2800. And let's say the flow through that, the airflow, which combustion doesn't do anything. Compressor gives you the flow. Let's say it's like 100 pounds, okay? So now to go to the same temperature, you see that you need much lower uh, mass flow wise um, uh, hydrogen flow. Hydrogen, you need only 1.2 pounds, whereas like you need 2.9 pounds of uh, methane. So you need much less by mass. But now look at the few other thing. As you burn hydrogen, there is no carbon dioxide, okay? But you are getting 5% carbon dioxide from burning methane, you get 10% water. Just remember this carbon dioxide and water, they have an implication for NOx, we will talk about it later. But let's say now like you want to bring up the fuel, your fuel comes at ADF, you will need much more heat for, uh, for hydrogen. And also remember I talked to you like, uh, even though methane has high energy density, but by volume it's much less, so you see like your volume flow rate, okay, is much more for hydrogen. It's like 13 pounds versus four pounds, okay? For, no, four feet per cube, sorry. Four cubic feet versus 13 cubic feet. So three times more. That creates problem for power plants, okay? So this table, this simple math, actually will tell you like how many things can go wrong for you in a gas turbine, okay? So now, again, we talked about auto ignition. So so the, why do we worry auto-ignition? Because we mix our fuel and air. So if the auto-ignition time is very fast, you basically cannot mix it. So if or there has to be some delay uh, in auto-ignition. And as your temperature goes up, auto-ignition delay starts to go down. So it's, it's opposite, okay? So it it's basically starts with the bottom. The top, the black line is methane. So methane has the longest delay. We could mix methane. We can take as long, no issues, okay? So then as you start to go down, basically you see like your, with blends, different blends, your auto-ignition time starts to go down. So that's a problem. If now with 100% hydrogen, uh, you, are, you're, you don't have enough time to mix, you can never make a premix technology. You have to think about something else. But the good thing is that table on the, uh, on the right, Basically, it says these are in seconds delay, okay? Uh, in those calculations are not correct, not very accurate, but what you start to see is like, the, even with like 80, 100% hydrogen, it's in the three seconds. Do you know how, much, how long is a residence time in a gas turbine premixer? It's like in the millisecond, okay? It's like three to four milliseconds you can mix. So three to four millisecond versus uh, four seconds, you have like an order of magnitude more residence time. So actually no issues for premixing. There's something interesting. Uh, uh, so in, in, so why, 
we feel that we are good because we take care in designing the gas, uh, the premixers. So there are something called recirculation zones. In a recirculation zone, the residence time could be infinite, okay? So when you are basically doing fuel plenums, fuel pipes, and fuel valves, there are pockets where fuel can get stuck with air and can exist longer, and those things can auto-ignite, okay? So then those will become problem. But for premixers, we design it clean, we, we make sure that it's clean so that auto ignition time is never a problem, okay? And I talk about some reactions, uh, maybe we'll, we'll skip those. There are reason for why, which reactions, like hydrogen basically, if you look at it, the most important reaction is the bottom reaction, which takes the least energy and you can start it quickly. And the interesting thing is methane chemistry also depends on hydrogen chemistry because as methane breaks down through the bottom, those two reactions, it starts to generate hydrogen or hydrogen atom that creates the radical pool, okay? So hydrogen chemistry is basically, and CO chemistry is basically embedded in methane chemistry, okay? And I'll not talk through here like different paths. Okay, so now the most important problem we'll talk about is flashback. Actually, I missed something. I had a, let me see, go back. I had a flame speaker. Yeah, I deleted it. Yeah. Okay. Just stay out. We'll come back quickly there, okay? So we talked about auto ignition delay. The next thing is uh, talk about flame speed, the speed at which flame can travel. If you start to look from the bottom and as you go up to the top, top is hydrogen, okay? And you can see like going from the bottom to the top uh, in the curve, it's like 10 times more. So it's so much reactive as we were looking at, it's like 10 times faster, okay? And these shows basically here are different conditions. We have E, F, and H class, different as you go to higher efficient engine, your flames, laminar flame speed is, is basically rising. So if you look at like a red, uh, is around 0.2 and you go to the H class, it's like six times, around six times more reactive, okay? So laminar flame speed is the start, but what is important is the turbulent flame speed, okay? So uh, flame speed is a big important thing, so we'll go back now, okay? So flashback, okay. Uh, flashback is, remember I said in a premix combustion system, we want to premix fuel and air. So there is a limited space where we premix and then we have a flame. When the flame starts to go back into the premixer, that's called flashback, okay? And there is several ways you can have flashback. Uh, if you have a swirl flow, uh, you basically, no, actually start doing, if you have your velocity of the flow, if it is less than the speed flame wants to come, you will have a flashback. Basically, flame will come from the, where your, we call it liner or combustor, to where your premixer is, and basically damage your hardware and everything. So that's one, okay? So that's why it says, uh, uh, then the other is, you know, like, uh, when we, in the boundary layer, Okay, the velocities are small, are, are basically, it goes in the wall, it's, you have zero and then it starts to grow and basically it has a developed velocity profile, okay? So flame can walk through the boundary layer if you have fuel there. And that's a problem, okay? And then, uh, there were other things. There, there is also dynamics, remember, what right? we talked about, if you have small, like small uh, frequencies, like in the 100, 200 hertz frequencies, dynamics with good magnitude, your flame can start to come back, okay? So those are the reason why you get like uh, flashbacks. So we talked about boundary layer flashback, core flashbacks, and then thermoacoustic flashback, okay? Okay, here are some examples of flashback. You start to see, yeah, you start to see like you are sitting with it, and then as you go, basically the flame starts to walk back. Flame is going inside, and you can see it changes color. Basically, flame has fully gone in. So you cannot sustain that operation many longer. 
can I, how can I play this video? That's the, okay, so look at here, like this is from our lab, okay? Uh, we were running flame, it's hydrogen flame. You, you'll see like, all, yeah, that's flashback, okay? See how fast that thing died? So that's, that's bad, okay? Uh, and we were just testing it and it flashed back on its own. We didn't have to do anything. So this, that's why we test small scale. When we feel like we have cleared small scale flashback, we start to big bigger scales because there is no point burning hardware uh, that, that are big. You start with small, your expense is less, okay? Okay, so. Okay, so that's one type of flashback we talked about. So I don't know whether that, we couldn't tell whether that's a bulk flashback, but our velocities were very high, so we think it was a flashback through the boundary layer, okay? And then uh, over here is a picture of like, again, this is actually a vortex breakdown. So like when you scroll something in the center, you have less pressure. And then as flame starts to come back, it puts a resistance and basically that lets the flow separate in the center and then flow can go backward. And that's how you get basically a, a, a flashback, okay? So, the, and then this was an example. Remember I was talking about boundary layer separation? In the boundary layer, uh, your flow basically uh, faces, you need, uh, you basically grow from a very small velocity to high velocity. So as you are, if you have a flame that's trying to come back, you basically have some resistance. So flow will switch back on you. So flow turns, as flow turns, you basically have flame that comes all the way in, okay? So there is an example here uh, of a flashback. This was in the paper, one of the paper, is one of, uh, one of the OEMs. So flame basically would come back through this area. And once it comes back uh, from a small, it's so, inter so interesting, a flame like it can adjust. It's sort of like a very living thing. It adjusts, it moves, and once it finds its way, it can go in fully, okay? You, you would be surprised how fast a flame will respond, okay? So that's the biggest problem, and this is dynamics. I will not go through. Here are like the, you, it's frequency, but frequency for your pressure pulse, uh, and then also for the heat release. And what you will notice between the two charts are that all of a sudden your dynamics has gone from 86 hertz to 40 hertz, so it was half, okay? And, and you're, you basically then start to see flashback. And the amplitudes were not very different. It just changed its magnet, it's basically frequency of the dynamics. So you are, you are basically shaking, or you call it at a certain hertz. All of a sudden you do it much slowly, but it's longer. So you start to bring flame back in, okay? We talked about this. Okay, so now what I wanted to talk to you guys. Yeah, so th this is, I, I, where I'm going with this is this. In the past, all the gas turbine manufacturer used something called a swirler. They used to swirl and mix. The, there were two reasons why we used to use swirler, because swirler creates basically bigger, longer term, larger turbulent scale, it does mixing quickly. So you would use swirl to mix, and also there is something called a, what stabilization, it helped, because methane is less reactive, so what you try to do is create recirculation zones in the combustion section. Remember I said the flow goes by so high speed, so you try to create protective zones inside the combustor called recirculation zones, so flame can sit there and be there. So. Uh, so basically, I'm going to come back now. Now what I want to talk about is more, how can you predict or calculate uh, flashbacks, okay? So this is, if you want to, this is full, not in the textbooks, but mostly in the literature, okay? So they, remember I talked about if you are flashbacking through the walls, uh, there are two critical factors. One is chemistry. Chemistry determines how fast you can burn something, okay? And then flow is determining how fast you can push it out, okay? So there is always this competition between chemistry and flow. And there are two parameters. One is from the chemistry side, you calculate. Basically, there is something here. Remember, we talked about 
you have a flame speed from the flame speed, you will have a turbulent flame speed, okay? That's what determines how fast your flame is moving. And on the, on the boundary layer side, there is how the boundary layer develops, how the flow develops, there is a correlation where the flame velocity at which it's trying to come back is equal to the velocity is pushing back. That's where you start to have flashback. And now what does that let me do? This is a simple 0D, not any 3D calculations, okay? So there are certain interesting thing you start to see, okay? So there are three diameters here, okay? D1, D2, D3, okay? One is bigger than the other. So what it is telling me, okay? So the lines, the uh, horizontal lines are the flow lines. It doesn't change much because flow doesn't depend on hydrogen. Flow mostly depends on air. So you start to see, it doesn't change much the flow, critical parameters for flow. But what changes is the critical parameter uh, for the chemistry, okay? And, and then chemistry, remember we talked about, it's, it's, it's a turbulent flame speed. So the scale, is important, so that accelerates your flame speed. So you quickly basically start to see here is that uh, what I, I didn't give a range, okay? So you will see that smaller diameters are much better in resisting flame uh, flashback. So if you look at D1 would be the smallest, D2 would be the next smallest, and D3 is the largest. So as you, as, so as we want to use hydrogen, a lot of manufacturers are moving towards using smaller and smaller geometries. Smaller scale gives you basically that, uh, that resistance against flashback, okay? That's, okay, so that's one trend you can look. This is the impact of geometry. So in the, in the beginning, like if you go to, and look in the plant, a uh, premixer or a, a burner could be like three inch, five inch, but as you start to go to hydrogen, that burner might not be, you'll still use a bundle that's like five inch, but inside you will have elements, we call it micromixers that are like of a very small size, okay? Because it can resist flashback. Wait, uh, it starts from uh, something like 0.1 inch to three inch. 0.1, very small. <laughs> yeah, very small, yeah. So again, uh, then we showed basically velocities, okay? You, you can start to see like as you, velocity has some role uh, as you basically increase more and more velocities. Yeah, you see V1 is the smallest velocity. It basically cuts the flow line at much lower, 75%, where you, you basically when you're using the fastest velocity, you can go up to 90%. So as you increase velocities, your flashback becomes better. And then again, this is saying basically one TCD is better. So as you go to higher and higher TCD, your problem becomes worse, okay? so how. The problem that I will face in E class is much small, much less than the H class. So the, the design that may work in E class may not work in H class. So just think about it. We have all this. So what we did in the, in, in the past, we made one design and depending on the engine size, we scaled it up or we, we kept the same scale. We just produced many of them. We can't do that. We have to change the elements of our basic design. Okay, that's what this is telling us. And then you basically, uh, flow scale means again geometry scale. It tells you like E class, you can go, go to very high long scale, you can still do it. But with F or H class, you have to go down. Uh, you cannot go up, like if you use the same big diameters, you will not go up to like 100% hydrogen. That's what it's telling. So, okay, so then quickly going through, we talked about one thing was, uh, this is flashback. So this is the first problem, okay? The second problem is the dynamics. Remember we talked to you, it was a roaring dragon. Uh, so this, the dynamics changes as you change fuel blend. So what here they are showing, and dynamics also changes 
as your combustor length. So when we try to design a combustor, the initially uh, the length used to give you residence time, and residence time controlled your emissions. So you always try to make it smaller. Uh, but uh, when you make it smaller, NOx gets better, CO gets worse. But dynamics is very non-monotonic, okay? If you change length, you can create one tone. Uh, like you might have a longer geometry and you said, oh, I want to make it smaller for NOx. The moment you made it smaller, you basically have an excitation because there are modes that the combustor Combustion system puts in energy in the acoustic modes, okay? So what it shows here, there are two different fuels. One is methane and the other one is hydrogen. You could start to see like as the length goes. Uh, actually, this was helping. <laughs> this was saying like when you went to higher equivalence ratios, uh, your tones or the bars, red bars, they were all went become very small. So basically it's saying it's helping, but there is, I think the authors, uh, did something wrong because remember the right way to compare that axis would have been temperature, not equivalence ratios because hydrogen with higher or lower equivalence ratio has same temperatures as methane. So not necessarily the plot was uh, right, but uh, what you can start to see is like as you go up or go, down, go up in hydrogen, you can have combustion system that's quiet all of a sudden can start to become basically excited. So that's what this graph is saying, okay? So more, uh, more similar things again, like as you go to different uh, amount of hydrogen, the combustor becomes basically more excited. This is important because remember I told you, we are starting to go to smaller and smaller tubes. Those tubes are called micromixer. So I'll start to show you some geometry, maybe we'll come back. So what this is saying is like, look at here, this is methane, okay? When you have individual elements, hydrogen burns from each element distinct flames, okay? But when you burn methane, they all come together uh, because they are less reactive, they come up and they mix together and your big flame basically creates the system response, creates dynamics, whereas in, in, in hydrogen, all flames are very distinct that they have their own mode. And what they're saying is basically, as you go to hydrogen, you can start to see different levels, of different longitudinal modes, meaning like the first one is the first longitudinal mode, which could be in the hundreds or hundreds, uh, then you start to go up. As you go up, it could go back to 1,000. It could go back into kilohertz type modes, okay? So with hydrogen, you can go to much higher modes. Okay, so again, we mentioned, so we talked about flashback, okay? Auto ignition was not a problem. We talked about flashback, biggest problem. Uh, then we talked about dynamics, okay? The third problem, you were asked about NOx, okay? So, <laughs> The thing is still not fully, everybody sees like when they burn a lot or most of the manufacturer, when they burn hydrogen, their NOx emission gets worse. And this was one of our data, like 50% hydrogen, we saw like 1.4 times more NOx, but this data was carefully taken, meaning your exit temperature was made constant. So we see much more NOx, and there are references. So why does NOx change, okay? Couple of uh, things that can change NOx is premixing. So you have a given length. You are trying to basically premix methane. You target a unmixedness to decrease your NOx. Maybe hydrogen doesn't get fully mixed there. But it, that's not necessarily the case because those mixings are are controlled by the turbulent scale. And that does not change between methane and hydrogen. What happens is methane, when it comes out of the premixer, it has some time to mix in the gas in the liner. Maybe that's the time with hydrogen we lose. Hydrogen comes much, much forward, okay? So, and then maybe hydrogen has a different pathway to NOx formation. There is an extra path creating NOx in hydrogen. It's called NNH route. And then the other thing, very interesting thing is uh, you can change the flame front temperature which controls NOx by straight, 
maybe with hydrogen, it goes, uh, it increases and the flame temperature increases. So those are some of the uh, th things we are looking into, okay? Okay, so the other thing, uh, if you are, if you worked in a gas turbine plant, what you will see is everybody reports the NOx emission to 15% O2. So in the 60s or 70s, when they said, I have to control NOx, uh, they did not come with a number that you have to meet 25 at any oxygen level. There was a reason for that because gas turbine manufacturers have extra air. So let's say you have certain NOx from your gas turbine, you put that extra air into it and your NOx value will go down. So to control that, they basically said, wherever you go, you have to report it. I don't, I don't care how you got it. Once you got it at some oxygen level, you have to correct it back to 15% O2. So that correction was artificial, meaning that correction was just done to make sure when you look at a smaller gas turbine manufacturer, like a running smaller engine, versus a bigger one, they all rip, report NOx to the same correction. So that was one. The other one was when you measure, like when the product comes out, remember I told you it has CO2 and water and nitrogen, okay? So the, the detection system that measures it, they take water out. So let, let's, you have a mixture, when you take water out, everything gets inflated, okay? So the more water would be there, the more inflated your NOx would be there. But since you were burning methane or you were burning hydrocarbon, it did not matter, okay? But what, remember we talked about when you burn hydrogen, you are basically living with a lot more water, okay, than, for, than, you, than, than what you leave behind when you burn methane. So when you take the water out, even if you form the same NOx, hydrogen NOx will look higher, okay? So that's one. And then again, when you burn hydrogen, to get to the same temperature, you leave behind much more oxygen, as if somebody intentionally put some air in, okay? So that is a penalty. So if you look at that penalty, you basically, as a result, when you report NOx as 15% O2, it will always report higher. So industry is saying, no, 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 if you, uh, if today we have to report NOx for hydrogen, especially 100% hydrogen, I have to correct it by a factor of 1.35. Meaning if you burn hydrogen or methane, even if they produce same NOx on a weight basis, when you do the 15% uh, do, do correction and the water correction, your, your uh, high NOx from hydrogen will look higher. To undo it, basically you have to divided by a factor of 1.3, okay? So this is sort of being proposed as a norm. So this, because of this, you would see higher NOx, but the NOx that we see higher are not only because of this. There is something there that we don't fully understand, okay? Okay, now quickly, so now comes back, so I'm designing a gas turbine. I want you to un just think about this. So a gas turbine, operates in a space. It's sort of, I draw a three-dimensional space because that's what I can visualize, but there were a few. So you can see the spaces are pressure, uh, the temperature rise, and, and, and basically the inlet temperature, okay? So inlet temperature can go from ambient, which is like, depends on where you are, either you are now. <laughs> Whether you are in Alaska or you are in Sahara Desert, so it changes, but because of your compressor, it changes more. So your, your inlet temperature can, at the very start of an engine could be in like 50 or 100, 100 degrees F or like a zero degrees F, but by the time it goes to base load, it's like in the, in the 900 F, okay? So there is like a 900 F change. So it starts in the bottom corner, it goes way on the top. Your T39 initially could be only like a 200 degrees rise, okay, at the start. But by the time you go to base load again, it, it grows by 2000 degrees, okay? 
So is the pressure, you start with the low pressure, you have to go to full like 300 PSI. So that's the space your gas turbine operates. And you cannot come back and say, hey, my gas turbine is going to operate only in this space. Uh, you have to make sure that you operate in that space, you maintain your NOx and CO, the guarantees you made, then you maintain dynamics, because if you do not know about dynamics, your engine can break, and then your hardware durability. By that I mean, uh, when I buy your engine, you are promising me that I'm going to be able to run this for 8,000 hours without stopping if I choose not to, okay? So just think about how big for single fuel the space is. Now, think about, okay, I have methane, now I have hydrogen here. In the middle, I introduce all these different kinds of fuel, okay? 5%, 8%, 10%, 25%. And the bad news here for the gas combustion manufacturer is dynamics is not monotonic at all. Flashback is not monotonic at all on some of this, okay? You might not get flashback at the highest temperature and pressure. You might get it at the lowest temperature and pressure because the flow was so less there. And then it doesn't matter where you get it. Once you get it, your hardware is damaged, okay? So just think about the space and, and the cost it would take to develop the, that kind of operating system, or that kind of system, basically. Okay, so remember, I talked about like uh, we are going to, uh, we are changing our designs. So during 2006, no, yeah, during 2006 to 2011 in the US, there was a lot of shell gas and there were, there were also uh, gas um, IGCC plants. So they were thinking there would be like uh, IGCC like coal, they will gasify it and get CO hydrogen and they wanted to burn that. What happened was uh, the gasification process became very expensive, capital cost was big, it was stopped. But at that time, US government gave GE grants to say, hey, I want you guys to build this uh, technology that would basically burn hydrogen, some amount of hydrogen. So what we did was here, like we went and we, when you do initial testing, we do it at small scale to save cost. So we bought these premixers. They are, we put it different roll, different size, uh, whatever you can think of. There were like uh, different size, different length, different fuel size. And we went and went and we did flame holding testing. I will show you that test. And at the end, we determined basically the thing that works is this thing in the middle where your elements are very small, okay? So we call this our, as our micromixer. So we had developed this. It didn't go up to full 100% hydrogen, but it showed the most promise, okay? So this is micromixer from GE. And then now, as you, there are three other uh, micromixing technology I showed. So remember, like, NOx goes up, down, as you bring more premixing. Your flame holding risk goes up, as you do more, uh, less, uh, as you do more premixing, okay? So there is this competition. So G is, we are saying we want to do premixing, but there are other vendors, we, they're saying, no, we don't want to do premixing because it's a flashback risk. We want to come as non-premixed, but we want to burn in such a way, our NOx is going to be less. So they're going one way and we are, we are trying to basically say, no, we want to do premix because we want to keep NOx down, but we will also make sure that we don't get flashback, okay? So different vendors, different way of targeting the same problem. Okay, so uh, these were like how we developed technologies. Can, can I, how do I play this? Okay, so you will see what we do is uh, called the flame holding test. So we intentionally take the flame back, okay? And let it sit there, and if it does not go away, then we don't have a design that passes. So we will, yeah, you start to see something came out. We actually put another flame in, torch that lights up. You will see a couple of that, it's just growing, going, okay? So you, yeah, you start to see that we put a torch at the back of it to 
put a flame in the inside, okay? So it starts to clear, but at one point you'll see like that is a torch that lights up, intentionally creating like a flashback situation, okay? So when we shut the torch off, we want the flame to go away. So you will see at one, yeah, as more and more hydrogen it becomes, you'll see it hasn't gone out, okay? So it, it's basically saying maybe I will not pass this test, maybe, yeah. So th that's the end, we failed, okay? So what we basically intentionally put flame inside our premixer to make sure that if even a flashback comes, the velocity when it recovers, it can throw the flame out. You will see at one point basically this will never clear and we say we failed. So if we have to go to 100% hydrogen, we will have to pass this test. We, we go through this testing, okay? So again, remember I, I talked to you, so our scales was big, so we used to have basically diffusion combustor, then we went to inside here, these are swirl, big channels, you swirl and you premix to something like this kind of what we call an advanced premixer, where the length scales are going, are, are smaller now, okay? Just to, just to help us test or work with hydrogen, okay? And so if you look at our history, uh, we started there on the top as a premixer, we went to the right, okay? So in, in the bottom, this was our DOE program, government-sponsored technology development and how we did the technology. No swirling airflow, mm, yeah. So then, okay, there was some, another significant technology that we made, actually. This, I will talk about this and stop. So remember we said methane is slow, chemistry is slow, uh, hydrogen is fast. If you want to burn CO in methane, you need long combustor. CO, uh, hydrogen doesn't have methane, uh, CO, it doesn't care. So you can burn a very small combustor and get away with it. But now the problem that we face is they're saying you have to burn methane and you have to burn CO. So the longer we keep the combustor, the more NOx it creates, okay, for hydrogen and even for methane as the temperatures were going high. So we thought about, okay, what do we do? We basically did is we separated the two zones, okay? Uh, we basically said uh, there is a flame zone here and there is a flame zone here. And we can choose what percent of fuel we will burn in which stage, okay? Uh, so when, if I want to burn high, this is called axial fuel staging, okay? So this was first put in, into in practice by our company. Yeah. I actually worked on this first. I feel good about it. So, uh, so the stage, let's say an E-class combustor may be 18 milliseconds long because it has to burn CO. Uh, aircraft combustor is three milliseconds to six milliseconds, okay? Because it's short, they don't want to carry big footprints, okay? This is somewhere like these combustors are 12, 13, or somewhere in that range. So what we did was we said, okay, uh, when we are at high temperatures, where combustion is easy, we are going to put a lot of fuel downstream. And when we are in the low loads where the temperature rise is not enough, I, I need fuel, I will bring back more, all the fuel to the front. Now my air is 30% or half, so that temperature can rise much more so that it helps me burn. So that's how we basically solved for NOx and CO problems for our methane fuel. But that actually becomes very helpful for hydrogen and methane combustion because what I want to do is for hydrogen, I want to put more fuel at the, at the second stage and less fuel at the front stage because then it has small residence time. Whereas with the methane, it's opposite and depending on where we run in methane, I can choose where I want to put this fuel, okay? So basically you took a big comb long combustor, you shortened it in the, way you, in the way it works for you, okay? So this is called axial fuel staging. And we believe this will also help us to 
to, to go towards hydrogen and, and maintain NOx emission, okay? And also have less risk because uh, we do it at the, at the end, okay? And then this talks about our facility, like we, as I said, we run uh, in a year, depending on 100 to 150, not engine tests, but full-scale tests. What that means is one cavity, one can of an engine. And depending on it can be like uh, 7E, 6B to like H class. And it, we keep running and there is infrastructure that supports that. And you can use any fuel. Uh, so today we are in, in the past like years, we didn't need that much hydrogen. So our hydrogen capability was not as much as that I can run a full H class. So I can run H class up to like 50%, 60%, but we are building capability. We are building our, our, our labs so that we can do full 100% com, uh, hydrogen. So what we want to do is we want to test in our lab, then in our engine, then go to customer, okay? I think that's it. Do we have any question for Dr. Hassan? I turned it off prematurely. Thank you, Hassan. Uh, it's a very interesting talk. Uh, brought back a lot of memories <laughs> working <laughs> with you. <laughs> so, uh, one question I wanted to ask you here is, uh, when you use hydrogen, do you have any issues faced there just in terms of like a material embrittlement? Have you? Uh, embrittlement, yeah, absolutely. I didn't even talk about it. So do you, can you just uh, share your experiences or? Yeah, it, it does embrittle. So we are looking at um, materials that don't embrittle, okay? Uh, so we use this printing, okay? Uh, all our premixers are printed now, okay? So we are looking for materials. We are developing material carbs. We are running embrittlement test so that uh, we have the life we need, okay? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I had a quick question about hydrogen. You mentioned earlier that it has a very high auto ignition, auto -ignition temperature compared to hydrocarbons and yet at the same time it has a low ignition energy. And I was kind of wondering, how can we make sense of that? What does that mean? Uh, ignition energy, um, let me think about it, I'll come back. Uh, I think there is a reason uh, why the ignition energy and they are not, sep they're separate basically. Uh, I need to think about it a little bit. I can't think about it. It looks uh, contradictory. Yeah, thanks for the nice presentation. So uh, I have a one general question. So usually when we increase the hydrogen fractions, of course, definitely NOx coming out more and more. So I, as far as, as I understand from your slide, try to control or reduce the, the peak temperature. But I, I believe that most of the NOx actually nitrogen is coming from the oxygen. So uh, what about we change the, uh, some other oxi oxidization? I mean, instead of the O2, how about we use some other argon like that? Is it possible in gas turbine sector? No, because you can't. Just think about the amount of, even a small percent is what per, what kind of flow you need to flow, okay? So you will need compressors. So these are all running at pressure. So you have to compress that. We have it, we call, we add dilution. We are, can add steam, we can add nitro, uh, nitrogen. We have done that, okay? But that basically creates an efficiency penalty, okay? Okay, thank you. I have a general question. Uh, yeah, here, on your... Oh, okay. Yep, yep. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> no problem. So uh, you would say um, how many of your customers are asking for capabilities of burning hydrogen at the moment? Is it a hot topic for from commercial point of view or not much? No, everybody. 
Like Everybody. it's like the 80 percent, 90 percent. Yeah, any you would be surprised anywhere you go. Like even I come from Bangladesh. Okay, if they want to buy a combustion system, they will say, "What is the hydrogen cable?" Okay. Yeah, so because there is uh, many of those things are funded by banks, and banks do not want their investment to lose value, so they will ask for it. Okay. Okay. That that that's the reason most of it. Most of the time, that people want some hydrogen cable. Good morning, Hassan. Hey. Thank you very much for this excellent talk. I have a question. Um, I remember you, if I'm not wrong, you have worked on catalytic conversion also. Yes. And uh, I always thought about uh, having ammonia to avoid all the transportation issues and so on and so forth. And while it's entering uh, into the combustion chamber, uh, do the uh, ammonia uh, cracking uh, using some catalyst, and then have a mixture of ammonia and uh, hydrogen going into, uh, into the combustion chamber, and you can tailor it to have right kind of combustion. Do you think anybody is looking into this? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. People are, uh, you know, I believe there's a talk after today after me or tomorrow yeah 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 absolutely yes uh, I think the problem is as you just said there is fuel bound nitrogen that creates not in a hundred it, many hundreds okay so how do you control NOx again the same thing you don't want to give up NOx okay so if there is no additional question let's thanks uh, uh, dr asan again thank you everybody